Before I introduce our uh, speaker today and, and what we're going to be doing, um, I want to just kind of give a little bit of context to kind of this forum and, uh, and to say that um, uh, first, you know, just to say um, it's really exciting for those of you who have joined us today who don't, haven't been a part of this whole process. So for our friends from the Muslim community, welcome. We're, we hope you feel at home here among us today. So really this update is mainly for you. But for the last um, uh, several months, we have been doing a, uh, an education forum uh, with the topic uh, entitled, um, Where Do We Go From Here? We're kind of thinking about our nation right now and thinking about the most constructive and productive way forward as a church community and as individuals. And so we've been using a curriculum called the Reclaiming Jesus Civil Discourse Curriculum. And we're, we've been thinking a lot about civil discourse. How do you engage people um, on the other uh, side of the Topics, you know, on the across the aisle, who feel very differently than than you might feel. How do you do it in a civil way and in a way that kind of preserves uh, one's integrity and moves you forward? So, uh, a part of this reclaiming Jesus uh, curriculum um, is that we've had multiple lay leaders kind of take sections and facilitate it. And so, I just wanted to pause and say a big thank you to those who have already led us through our forums for uh, Dan Beaupre and Carl Schaefer, uh, for Earl O'Donnell, and um, uh, for Roxy Wolf who said that she would do it, but she unfortunately was not well the day she was leading it. And so, Bill, thank you for stepping in, Bill Reisner. And then for Penny Winder, um, who is going to be leading the session next week. And I'll tell you about that in a second, but, but the big, big thank you I want to offer today is to Lisa and Bill Reisner, who have really headed up the adult forums this fall. So let's please say a big thank you to them. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, we're just a couple of sessions away from ending this uh, quarter's adult forums. Next week, uh, Penny Winder is going to be leading a, a session on uh, what does it look like to create space for healthy and safe debate. And then at that session and the one after that, we're going to start zeroing in a little bit more on specific areas of civil discourse that we as a church can um, uh, go a little bit deeper into. Uh, now, mixed in with all of uh, this curriculum that we've been doing and studying, we've had some incredible speakers, uh, many of, of which were, are nationally known. Um, we had Daryl Davis, who came and spoke to us on uh, fear and racism. Uh, we had um, Gustavo Torres came and talked about the immigrant experience in America today. Jonathan Faust came and led us in a, a time of thinking about forgiveness, which is a topic I think every single one of us who is here benefited from. Uh, and then we had better angels come and talk about how to have uh, a discussion between blues and reds, you know, talking politics there. Uh, today we have uh, another amazing adult forum um, in store for you. This is uh, Imam Tarif Shraim, who many of you might remember. He is uh, the chaplain and um, an imam at the uh, Center for Muslim Life at the, did I say that right? Right, right, I'm getting there. Yeah, so the Center of Muslim Life uh, at the University of Maryland, and also one of the imams at the um, Islamic, uh, community, Islamic Community Center in Potomac. We have many friends here uh, who are from there uh, today, and, and those of you who know, we, have, we enjoy a very uh, life-giving and loving relationship with the um, ICCP, and so uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, today, uh, the topic is about the Muslim experience in America, and I'm seeing half of us are Muslim in this room, and so uh, you, we'll, we'll have a lot to uh, offer and maybe at some point I might actually even break us up if we have some time into little groups where we can have members from the Islamic community join up with some of us Christians and just uh, for smaller uh, more intimate conversation. So we'll see what, how the time goes uh, for that, and we'll get there. Uh, without further ado, I've talked for way too long. I'd like to invite you to give uh, Imam Tarif a very warm St. John's welcome. Do you have a, you have a microphone? There it is. Is this loud enough? You guys feel comfortable? Okay. Uh, we're just going to sit casually here, and I'm going to um, ask uh, Tarif a couple of questions. But, but first, Tarif, anything you want to say just kind of as we open up, and then I'll, I'll get us going with some of our questions. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, and uh, peace and blessings to this incredible, beautiful, heartwarming community, your community, uh, Brother Sari. He's a brother to me. and. Um, Words can't articulate um, our human experience when we connect with each other. And I honestly can say that uh, Sadi has been a brother. He's a teacher. He's a priest. He's a religious leader. But at the end, he's a human being that cares. 
and that touches deeply more than anything else. I really want to th thank you, Sarah. You've been, you guys have been there throughout the last couple of years since we've been blessed to get to know this incredible community that doesn't just preach and speak of compassion, but that walks the walk. Uh, we felt it. We sensed it. Uh, when we get invited here, I really mean it, we're invited to our home. And it's, these are not just words. Uh, this is the experience of everyone that, every Muslim from our community that is, that is showing up. They're showing up because they really feel welcomed in this community. And um, that's worth um, uh, the world. It's very precious. We're grateful to be here, uh, to experience also this fellowship. Uh, because it's within these beautiful spaces of inclusion, of connection, that you get to experience the real. And hopefully also collectively experience healing and growth. So thank you so much for thank inviting you, us. Thank you. So uh, this is um, a, just a really sacred time for us here today. We hear a lot of rhetoric in our nation today um, publicly that's anti-Muslim. Um, some of it is explicit and some of it is implicit. And uh, what we want to do is just create a little space for us to go behind the scenes with you uh, as an imam. And, and it will ask you if you could just take us a little bit uh, into your own community. Mm. Um, what are people, how are Muslims feeling about um, uh, their existence in America today with, with all of this? Um, what, what are we not aware of that, because um, we can, I think most of us here can imagine um, the, uh, the difficulty of that, but we'd like to, I think, maybe get a little bit of a, a personal perspective on, on that. So just let's just start there. Thank you. Well, thanks again for this uh, question, and um, you know, I, I like to be real. I I like to bring my own human experience. I'll never, I can never articulate somebody else's experience um, until I go through things myself, and that's the whole notion of empathy. So I've been blessed to, you know, as, as a um, an activist, as a, as a uh, you know, religious leader, just as you are, so to be able to, to have many encounters of people of all ages and backgrounds and experiences. Uh, within the Muslim community, I can bring it back to me as a human being as well, because their experience is my experience. I'm not only an imam, but I'm also a father, uh, a husband, uh, a citizen, a community member, a neighbor. Um, and I could just bring it, bring it to, to this simple um, reflection on it. Um, think of what's out there <clears throat> and the stories, because that really, I think, captures the emotions of what people are feeling. Uh, we're all telling stories about each other. And, 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 and nowadays, think of the images, the tweets, the labels uh, that are being spewed out about Muslims through print, media, through television, Hollywood, political discourse by politicians. Think of the images to yourself. What are the images that come up about me? I am Tarif right here. Um, you know, I'm Muslim, I'm also Arab, I'm, I'm Palestinian, uh, but I'm also a father and a husband. And so what is being said about me? What is that label? What is the story? It's a scary story. I'm being, you're, you're literally being asked right now through the airwaves, through the political rhetoric to believe that I'm a villain. Uh, I'm out there to get you, right? Uh, no matter what I show you on the exterior, you cannot trust me. I'm not really committed to your values, right? Uh, I have a sinister plan to undermine you. I hate the West. I hate everything that is non-Muslim, non-Arab. And for somehow, I, I, somehow I hate life. And I also wish for my children the same. Just think of the images. The images of violent people blowing up themselves, waving the sword, chanting jihad and Allahu Akbar, right? Dark, sinister people who are just, you know, frowning at you, out to get you. You think of that woman, right, that is covered, covering herself, covering her head, being oppressed, right? Being dragged by her husband. She has no rights. She possesses uh, no entitlement to anything in this life. Literally being bombarded by that, that image next, you know, day and night, then that being juxtaposed to the word Muslim, Arab, Palestinian, whatever it is, that is not us. You hear of words that are being uh, spoken out there by politicians that literally describe Muslims as rabid dogs, right? As Carson has, um, uh, you know, entertained us with, um, you know, a couple of years back in the presidential elections. Um, you hear of... Um, 
politicians literally describing Islam as a cancer, malignant or not, pick, you know, pick, right, one of them, it doesn't matter, it's a cancer, and cancers have to be gotten rid of because they're a danger. So we're being described as cancer, rabid dogs, aliens, radical, barbaric, right, oppressive. What do you, what do you expect, what kind of conceptions and, and images or perceptions are going to be, you know, formed in people's minds about me as, as a human being. Literally, it's a dehumanizing picture. Now, Muslims of all ages and, 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 and backgrounds, and I'm here to tell you is Muslims come from every corner of this world. You know, Arabs constitute just a small percentage. Again, another misconception of Muslims. We come literally from every possible background you can imagine, right? There is you know, close to two billion Muslims on this earth, yet the entire story of all these Muslims, including the six, seven million in America, are re being reduced to this simplistic, reductionist, dehumanizing label. You're literally being asked to believe that I'm not a human being. And now that's a feeling that every Muslim walks with. That, that suspicion, that no matter what, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I can't fit in, right? I'm not accepted. It doesn't mean there is no um, uh, reassuring good experiences out there that restores that hope and, and healing. But I'm talking and, you know, as, as a common byproduct of the political rhetoric that is out there, the dehumanizing language and the images that are being spewed out by politicians, by, by the media. They're literally reinforcing a very scary image that takes a toll takes a tremendous toll and the emotions of human beings, no matter what. And I see it with students, I see it with women, who are, as I give an example, literally right now, many are afraid to just keep their hijab on. Me and my wife having to think, you know, did we do the right thing by calling our children, giving them Arab names? Because now they can be singled out, right? They can be identified as alien. These are real conversations that are happening in our communities. The fear is real. It doesn't mean there's no hope, mm -hmm. but people are walking with that trepidation and anxiety mm -hmm. over what can happen. Because, you know, fact of the matter is that Muslims are uh, being demanded to live up to a standard that is not real, that is not also afforded to other people. I give you an example, and I'll probably end my comments here so that we can go back, you know, and, and, and give space for more thoughts and reflections. Imagine the situation where a terrorist attack happens. I can tell you as a reaction to all of this, even for, Muslim, for Muslims who say, no, 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 we're good, we're okay. I know for a fact, and ask any Muslim uh, out there uh, and, and, and about the conversations that are taking place within their communities or their households, we're literally terrified whenever we hear the news of a terrorist attack. And why do you think that is? Because the public automatically associates that crime with every Muslim out there. Right? And because we're going to be demanded to denounce it all out right away, because somehow if a Muslim commits a crime, mass murder, terrorist attack, suicide bombing, somehow because of the shared faith, every other Muslim bears responsibility somehow. That's the pressure that we feel. We're terrified whenever we see a terrorist attack. And we pray. First of all, for, for people who are suffering, but we're also praying, oh God, don't make it a Muslim. Mm. Now imagine having to walk around with that feeling, that sensation, that stress, that, oh my God, what's going to happen right now? Because we're, you know, we're being seen with suspicion. And for me, honestly, that's the very definition of bigotry, to be associated with a crime, to be seen that, you know, as if you are sympathetic with those killing, murdering, just because of your faith without knowing anything about you. That's a real feeling, I'll be honest with you. And it cuts across communi Muslim communities, young and old, everybody's feeling that strain. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tarif. You know, one of the issues is that we have, um, we've stopped seeing people as people and really humanizing them. And so my question, my next question has to do with, um, I'm a pastor, you're an imam. Um, we have people come to us to talk to us about kind of some of those deeper struggles and the things that um, really trouble us. And I am curious, um, as specifically as someone who leads young people a at the University of Maryland, young Muslims, um, what are what are some of the um, pastoral things related to being Muslim in America today that? 
people come to you with? Is, is it a subject that you guys talk about like when you mm. preach, um, when you're spending time with young people? Is it a relevant topic that you are all bringing up and discussing? Is it something that no one wants to talk about? What, how, how, do you, how are you dealing mm. with that and, and all of this, um, these dynamics in your own community? Um, yeah, this has been um, a very dominant theme, whether it's explicitly or implicitly you know, stated, uh, people's fears are real. And I want to just also highlight that what we're talking about is not theoretical. Uh, the negative anti-Muslim rhetoric, and it's real and it's pervasive, and there's no denying of it. The marginalization of a people has consequences. It takes a toll, and it can be not just immoral, it's not just immoral, it's lethal. That's what people do not understand is that people are afraid for their lives now. Muslims have been bullied, harassed, racially profiled. I've been racially profiled myself in an airport. My wife, who was born in this country, knows no other place in, in her existence other than America. Um, she's a physician. On her way back, as an American citizen, coming back from Canada uh, about 15 years ago, a, a member of a 20-member team right, of physicians coming back, she was singled out to be profiled for a couple of hours. And they said, you're randomly selected. Why? Because of her name, and she's wearing the hijab. Everybody knew it. Everybody was shocked in her team that this has happened to her. This is real. Now it can also translate into physical violence. Many Muslims have been killed in this country because of somebody fearing, now Muslims, because of what they've been told, right? If you keep telling me I'm, 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 I'm out there to get you, I'm a threat to you, and I pose an existential threat to you, there are people who are going to take matters into their own hand and exercise violence. Mosques have been firebombed in this country, right? People have been harassed, discriminated against, killed, murdered, right? Um, and, and so this is real for people. It, it, women with hijab, they had their hijabs pulled off. Literally, I fear for my wife whenever she's walking, I'll be honest with you. We trust in God, but ultimately, it's real. The foul language being used against us all the time. I can tell you about an experience where I was driving with my family in Connecticut a few years ago. I have twins. Somebody, rec you know, driving by us, saw my wife and my sister, they were wearing, the, they were wearing the hijab and tried to run us off the road. It was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. And you, I, I, you couldn't even think straight to call 911, right? And it was very scary. This is real. A lot of Muslim families have gone through this. So coming back to the pastoral tools, uh, first of all, yes, we do reflect and talk a lot about this, about adversity and overcoming adversity in general. Uh, and, 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 and kind of incorporating a spiritual component to all of this, understanding that, listen, you know, we're here as human beings ultimately facing adversity, and, and, and that, that adversity ultimately is a catalyst for growth. It's an opportunity just as, it is a, as, just as it is a hardship. So we try to connect it to God as much as we can, and understanding that ultimately, just as in the beautiful Christian tradition, God is in control. And we're agents on this earth, that you know, we walk this path with this full awareness that ultimately, you know, no plan trumps the plan of God, so to speak. Uh, evil is real, suffering is real, we need to make the most of it. And, and I would say that of, of all kind of um, issues that particularly young people suffer from, I would say that honestly mental health. You know, all of these experiences take a toll on you emotionally. People are stressed out, young people are stressed out, right? Many of them have you know, they have not known any other place, sorry, in their lives, so they naturally feel that they fit in, but yet there is this kind of questioning that is happening. You know, am I really part of this experience? Am I part of America? Uh, how are people looking at me? All this takes an emotional to toll on people, so people are feeling stressed out, they're feeling the strain. Self-esteem amongst young people in general is low, right? Um, what we try to do is, and you're aware of this, pastorally speaking, is, is really pe give people hope. Make them understand meaning, have purpose behind their journeys, understand that you know, behind all forms of suffering is, 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 an, is, is a real opportunity for growth, but also to learn about oneself, to connect in ways with others that we might, have, might not have connected, to be pushed and, and, and stimulated towards growth. So we try to find opportunities with young people, with also community members, 
to make sense of what is happening, but also to capitalize on the opportunities because God does not give us anything except for reason. So we see it as fitting kind of part of a bigger divine narrative. And we don't isolate ourselves. I'll be honest with you. We don't say, hey, we're the only ones walking out there we're with difficulties. No, we understand bigger than us is a story of so many other marginalized communities, right, that have gone through horrendous things as well, that we collectively are going through that. that just as there are people who are suffering, just as we are going through our hardship, there's tremendous voices for and, and ages of compassion and, and goodness that are honestly offering that hand. And we see it and we experience it. Amongst you is this incredible place, this space that we have sensed that compassion in. So we try to kind of open doors for them to connect in ways that can offer them that healing. Uh, and it does work. People are searching. People need to be heard, need to be validated. And I think even, you know, uh, Sari can tell you all about it. Sometimes all that people need is someone to hear them and validate their experiences. To say your story and your suffering is real and I empathize with you. Once people sense this, once young people send this, they feel validated, it's very empowering for them. Thank you, thank so, you, that's, that's beautiful. Um, so one of the things is you kind of talk about community, the importance of community uh, as a way of m mitigating the sense of alienation. Um, one of the things in this community that we've been talking about a lot is how um, Americans today, like like white Americans living in this country who don't have the um, other stigmas like being a Muslim or being black, um, that uh, at this current juncture in time, uh, many of us feel like our values are uh, being attacked. And we feel like in many ways we're being attacked. Um, which gives us a little bit of insight into what it must feel like to have um, kind of a, to f feel like something's at risk of being lost. So I want to ask you just for a moment, from uh, the perspective of a Muslim, and I re re realize I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of all Muslims in the world, right? But from your perspective, what does all this mean uh, for American values today? The fact that you're living in this country as a Muslim, and there is, seems to be an increase in anti-Muslim rhetoric. What does, that, what does that mean for us as Americans and, and American values? It's a beautiful question. Thanks, Sari. And um, you know, it's one of the blessings I feel uh, for you know, our community is the fact that we're going through an experience that makes us uh, ask ourselves critical questions, uh, go through our own, our own growth, but also put things in a bigger context. And, I, and I'm very um, uh, encouraged to see that conversations are mature. They're not you know, staying at the superficial level. And I can tell you that as someone, and, and I know Sarah can speak a lot about this, uh, with his incredible diverse background and also where he's come from, the places of struggle he's come from, um, that Muslims really appreciate this incredible country because many of them have come from places of suffering and hardship. So Muslims, at least first generation, right? They've made a choice to come here. Just keep that in mind. They've decided to come into America and live in this country to pursue, quote unquote, the American dream and also find, find fulfillment and, 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 and you know, you know protection of their own well-being. They see that opportunity and they embrace it. So, and imagine, so imagine now for the second and third generation, they're growing into this country, this is their place. So this is a missed point for many people. There's still that perception that this Muslim is the other. So even though, even if I care for them, they're still the other. No, they're not the other. They're part, and part of the fabric of this country. And actually, Muslim experience extends way back historically. Over 20% of the American slaves were Muslim, right? Uh, and, and the existence of Muslims predates that, but it's not something that is highlighted in the books. So we do have a presence, and American, you know, Islamic history is really deep and interwoven with Western history as well. So that's a very key point. So for us, America is real, and it's, it's a place we care for, and we're protected with our lives. That's why we're here. So for us, the preservation of what is American is sacred, because we know the alternative. Make sense? We know the alternative. And we've come from those places. And maybe some people might not have come from here. My children didn't. 
but also people who have only lived in this country might not know what's going on on the other side of the world. So for us to see the erosion of any of these values is a very scary thing. For us, it's the heart and soul of America. That's why we see ourselves as just a little tiny uh, part of that chain, of that story of America, and what keeps America what it is, right? For us, honestly, the, the erosion of the values of justice for all, inclusion, what, what makes America what it is. The inclusion and embrace of everyone, um, you know, who comes from, you know, every possible imaginable background, ethnically, religiously, is what makes America what it is. So when we fail in that, no matter who the targeted community is, and you can see a trend now, it's not just Muslims. There is a trend, and that's what concerns us, is that there is a gradual erosion of all of these values. Because at the end of the day, we can preach the values all we want. If we don't walk the walk and preserve them, they'll be lost. And how many nations has, it, has this has happened to? I mean, we've seen the evidence of what happens with values of justice, inclusion, equality, are eroded, literally the dismantlement of a society. And once they're lost, they cannot be regained easily. So for us, there is the, that bigger question of the becoming of America. What is America becoming, right? Sure, we're now the ones going through, amongst the groups, the marginalized groups that has gone through this hardship. But the question I think is for all of us as American is, what is becoming of America? Because once that uh, commitment to our values is being eroded and attacked and assaulted, right, in sub substantive, powerful ways, can we even reclaim them? So I think the call, we understand that we need to challenge ourselves and everybody around us to really think of what's happening to the heart and soul of America. It's not just about one marginalized group, is what, I guess what I'm trying to say. You know, um, the relationship with the Islamic Center of Potomac, Islamic Community Center, um, actually started after the most recent um, uh, election for presidency. Right. I think many of us felt like we have to become much more engaged. Uh, we can't just assume that things are okay. We have to um, be proactive. And that's why actually when the relationship, when we reached out to ICCP and, uh, and started that. So um, I, I, the reason I bring that up is when I asked you this past week, where do we go from here? One thing you said is that what we're doing here today by bringing our two communities together and having a forum like this is in many ways part of the answer um, because um, this it's the humanizing that happens. Um, I, I want to just open it up uh, because I actually do feel like it would be a good thing for us to um, gather in small groups in a little bit. So I just want to open it up maybe for five to seven minutes for some of your own questions uh, to Tarif. And then um, Bill and Lisa will walk by with microphones. Because we're videotaping this, it's important to speak into the mic so that it catches. I see uh, Peter back there. And then we'll do that and then we'll um, move on to the next piece. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Everyone here can give you a list of 
Bible passage. If you ask any Christian in this room, tell us a passage from the Quran, I wonder if anyone could do it. I beg you, think about those things to get a positive story going. No, just uh, thank you so much, Peter. So first of all, this is uh, broaching a surface of a conversation. And it was about real experiences. Experiences of hardship and suffering have to be articulated, even from a pastoral point of view. If, if you see someone, let's say a family member, who's wounded, who's uh, going through a hardship, before we even address their ability to um, you know, go out and you know, you know, you know, just let's say take advantage of a, an offer to go out and go on an outing, that wound has to be addressed. Uh, the stories have to be told because validation and acknowledgement is part of the solution. It's not sufficient to say, well, you know, we can focus on this other aspect of the story. No, stories of p people who are marginalized are real and there is a need for them to be heard. Because otherwise there's no empathy and understanding. But I want to assure you that a significant aspect of our message and our Quranic story is about hope, is about emphasizing the heroes, and believe me, there's no shortage of that from Muslims. We draw inspiration, incredible inspiration from our beloved Prophet Muhammad, from Jesus Christ, whom we see as one of the most sacred of figures. Uh, representing the beauty and majesty and goodness of God on this earth. S these stories are part of our narrative. Uh, they're real in our conversations. And that's what makes us you know, go and, and, and sustain our journeys and efforts, even in collaboration with others who, who see life in the same way. So this is, uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to even have more conversation so that we can exchange some of these thoughts. But you know, it, clearly in the interest of time, we're, we cannot get into all these other aspects of the conversation. But I want to assure you that, believe me, uh, there's nothing more significant than hearing about heroes. I couldn't agree more with you. And highlighting. Um, the similarities of the journeys of people that have gone before us, right? Their experiences and what, what made people ultimately triumph in their struggle with adversity. But thank you so much. Thank you, Tariq. Yeah. Um, Marnie? Thank you. So uh, you spoke before about the uh, diversity of the Muslim community across the world and in America. And I think you're absolutely right. That's something that many Americans don't really understand and appreciate. Can you tell us a little bit more about your community, both your students at the university and at the Islamic Center? Like, oh, oh, where are many of your people from? Mostly immigrants, mostly native-born Americans, things like that? Absolutely. Um, you, you know, Islam in general spa spans literally every possible culture imaginable you know on this that exists on this earth uh, we come literally and you'll see this representation in every community whether in the islamic community center of potomac which is 15 minutes from here uh, or students in the various college campuses around us you'll literally see a portion uh, of them being you know first generation uh, majority of the young people are second and third generation uh, ethnically, their parents or grandparents have come from every part of this earth they can imagine. A very small percentage from the Middle East, because there's this myth, uh, misperception that uh, Muslims are all Arabs. Only a very small percentage, less than 15, 10%, 10 percent perhaps, are Arabs. Majority come from other parts of the world, including Asia, uh, Europe, Africa, Latin America, indigenous people from here. Um, white, black, brown, name it, uh, men and women, literally, that's, and that's and I think one of the blessings of being in America is that we, we even as Muslims have come across and encountered Muslims who might not, we might not have met in our lives, right? Muslims are not Muslims in general, and that's the beauty of the American experiment. It does really put you in this kind of, uh, I don't like to call it pressure cooker, but there is, you know, the, the friction, the, the discomfort with the other who's different than you, whose habits are different than you. Yeah, they might even share your faith, but they're different. Mm -hmm. Now, can you, can you find common ground and grow together? That's what I call pressure cooker, because you need the steam to grow. Marriage, right? 
<laughs> There's a pressure there, right? Wait, so just, let me just but ask you for clarity. He doesn't want to go through marriage. Yeah, right. He stopped me right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just for clarity, when you said 15%, 15, 15, 20% are Arab, are you yeah. saying in this country or globally? Globally, that's, globally for sure. I mean, I don't know the percent. I'm not going to hold you to yeah, the exact numbers, but, but you're saying. 15% globally. Uh -huh. uh, and also, but you see honestly even the representation here. Uh -huh. um, very similar. Although some communities tend to be literally more tilted towards one particular ethnicity than others, we at least here in Potomac, our representation of the diversity of Montgomery County, literally. So within our mosque, you'll see Muslims talking every language you can imagine, coming from every background, including professional backgrounds as well, spanning every field you can imagine, um, and also of all ages and, and experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Tarif. Great question, Marnie. Can we get one or two more maybe, and then uh, David? Hello. Um, could you, you just stand up? Thank you so much, okay. brother. Thank you. The um, extra um, disheartening for me for the uh, when I'm thinking about the recent rise in Islamist phobia and um, anti-Semitism is this is happening at a time of uh, relative economic prosperity, and um, so if it's happening now, like when when is it ever going to get better? So I, my question is: Is there a community um, either now or in the past that? that uh, we should look at as a model, like Singapore, like where, where we do have some, I, I don't know if Singapore is the answer, but I mean, uh, do you look at a community worldwide where they seem to get it right or closer? Israel, Palestine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go, beautiful. Wow. It's a good question. I, 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 th I think, you know, Perhaps my, my name, you know, my head cannot think, oh, that one country. Because, you know, every country has, you know, the, 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 the upside and the downside, uh, some worse than others. Uh, but I can tell you that what's real is experiences within communities, right? I can, we can, there are incredible precedents historically for this. Absolutely. Even as, as Muslims, like Muslim Spain was actually an example of this, were incredible, incredible um, um, kind of connections happen across faiths, and we've seen, you know, the the fruits of that, the incredible prosperity that has happened when uh, those in charge, politically speaking, opened up the spaces for everybody to thrive and connect, when everybody was accepted. I mean, I can draw inspiration from that historical example. You can actually revisit, and you know, part of the story of. Of, of the missing, you know, the missing narrative, the missing story is that the Muslim story has not been told, even as being part of an, uh, the American story. I mean, um, we we take pride in many of the great things that have happened in Muslim history. We understand also the challenges, but but the the proof of um, kind of communities coming together and um, uh, demonstrating that the possibility for healing, for growth, for understanding is real. It has happened historically in many you know, places of this world. It's happening also here. It's happening right here in this space. It's happening, imagine, there are many other communities across America where, where not only these conversations, but the acts of solidarity, the, the, the alliances are being formed, where hate is being combated. Elisa, where are you? Elisa, she was just talking to me about an incredible effort in Montgomery County that was spawned I guess when was it started, Lisa? Right after the 2016 election. You're right, of uh, communities coming together. I think she can speak to it more. I was so interested in even learning more about it. I, all I'm saying is that there are incredible, not only just signs, initiatives, efforts, uh, work that is happening on the ground to combat all this negativity and, and hate that is out there. And I think that's what it takes. So we're ready see the examples and the evidences amongst us. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. Thank you. The uh, we're gonna, we have such a great wealth of insight and experience in this room. And what I wanna do is, um, and Tarif and I will just come down and join the groups. Let's split up into groups of uh, four and five. Just, I, I, I see uh, Muslims and Christians all over this room. So I'm sure you, any group of four or five, you're gonna end up with uh, people of both faiths. And let's just get together. And I just wanna invite uh, St. John's, uh, you all to um, maybe use that time to ask maybe some of your um, specific questions uh, and get some uh, different experiences. 
Is, does that sound okay? And we'll bring everyone back together, and then uh, and we'll we'll allow um, uh, Imam ask him to give some closing remarks. So let's do that at this time.